Um, well, hello, Mr. Sosa. Um, well, I'd like you to ask you a few questions about um, the brain and how that connects to <clears throat> our education. So, first of all, how did you realize that the brain was such an important part in education and in the learning of, uh, on the learning of uh, the process of learning? Well, let's ask ourselves: What is it that teachers do? Teachers come into the classroom and they try to transmit some information to the student. What does the student do? The student's brain has to hear this, see it, and then make sense of it. So the more the teacher knows about how that brain works, the more successful they can be at it. So about 20 years ago, when we started to be able to use um, scanning technology to look inside the human brain while the person was still alive, uh, we began to understand what goes on in the brain when people are learning. Sometimes uh, the prop, there are problems, and we can understand those better as well as people learn. So it became clear to me that teachers, what they're trying to do is change the brain. So the more, in fact, I call teachers brain changers because that's what they are. And the more they know about how that brain works, the more likely they are to be successful at changing it and for students to be more successful and to learn better. So the brain becomes the center of learning. Um, and those, so, so the more you know about it, and we're finding out an awful lot about it in the last 20 years, incredible amounts of information. And some of that uh, teachers need to know because that's what they try to do. We're not trying to make neuroscientists out of teachers. We're just trying to say, look, your job, you know you're trying to change the brain. Here's some information that may help you do that. So according to what we know about neuroscience, what changes uh, should we encourage the teachers to do in the classroom so that they can you know, pass that information better to the students? Right. Well, um, the, a whole new field of scientific study has grown up in the last mm, 10 years. It's called educational neuroscience. And what that is is a way of taking what we learn. Now, a lot of things we learn about the brain has nothing to do with what we do in schools. It, so often it has to do with um, medical problems. But we're talking about the process of learning, of acquiring skills and information. And we're learning a lot about that. We're learning, for example, about attention. How do, how do we get the brain's attention, especially these days with so much technology around that students' attention is always being pulled somewhere. How does a teacher maintain ten attention in a classroom? Not like 25 years ago when there wasn't much other technology but the teacher. Uh, we're learning about memory. You ask every teacher in the world, and I've been all over the world, and I've asked teachers this question, how long do you want your students to remember what you taught them? And they all say the same thing, forever. But it doesn't happen. Now why not? So uh, as we understand more about memory, working memory, which is temporary, long-term memory, the more we understand about that and transfer that information to teachers, then they can develop strategies that, are, that will increase the chances that not only will students learn things, but more importantly, remember them. Because so often, teacher comes back to a topic three months later and the students say, we never had that. I don't remember that. <laughs> Every teacher has experienced that. So how do we change that? Um, I think those are probably the main areas. <clears throat> and well, comparing education with, for example, 25 years ago, um, now teachers have a, a closer relationship to the students. So what's the role of emotions in the process of learning? Well, <clears throat> it's very simple. Emotion drives attention. Attention drives learning. It's very difficult to learn something if you don't focus on it, if you don't attend to it. <clears throat> and emotions play an important role. How do we know that? We have two structures in the brain that are responsible for making memory, for taking what you learned today and encoding it into long-term memory. Those two structures are not in the rational part of the brain, they're in the emotional part of the brain. And what does that tell us? That any time you can link emotions to learning, there's a higher chance that the student will remember it. We, and you know from your own experience, we tend to remember the best and the worst things that happen to us. We don't remember those things that have no emotions attached, very rarely. So um, you try to use emotions two ways in the classroom. Number one, make sure the classroom is a welcoming environment emotionally, that, that people respect one another, that they not only 
give their own opinion, but they listen to the other, other people's opinions, that they can disagree without being disagreeable. So that there's a, uh, a feeling that we're all in here to learn together. So that's the emotional, what we call the emotional climate of the classroom. Then, if you can also link emotions to the learning itself, for example, um, if you're trying to learn about the Spanish Civil War and try to bring in some of the stories of the people who fought in it and who took different sides and uh, attach those emotions to it, you're more likely to remember and understand why it happened and what went on and uh, how uh, things ended up. So emotions play a very important role. And um, <clears throat> we find out from students, I'm, I, I'm sure it's almost the same here in Spain, but in the States, for example, we, we, every year we ask students, we, there's a survey that we do nationally, and we ask students, um, tell us what's the most important thing you want in a teacher. What's the thing you think most important a teacher should have? And for many years, they started these in like 1960, and for many years, up until about five or six years ago, the one that was always number one was fair. We want the teacher to be fair. Five or six years ago, it changed. Fair dropped down, and you know what went to number one? Care. The students want to feel that the teachers care about their success, that they feel the teacher wants to help me, be, not to catch me being wrong, but to help me to be right. So emotions play a very important part in, in teaching learning process. <clears throat> and, well, to um, go towards at the end of the interview, What's the role of the students? Because should these students also know about how their brain works? Should this also be um, part of the students' knowledge to be able to make their learning process better and help the teachers in doing this? Excellent question. The answer is absolutely. And we find, and we find that we can start in kindergarten telling kids about how their brain works. And they love it. They love to know how their brain works. And, uh, and when they know, you know, they say knowledge is power. Um, when they know how their brain works, when they know the kinds of things that will help them to remember something or the kinds of things that will interfere with their remembering something, then they can plan their study habits a lot better. So absolutely, the more we can teach students about how their brain works, and, and teachers who are using the neuroscience, what they do in the classroom is they'll often say, we're going to do this strategy, and this is why. This is how it's going to help you learn something. So they explain not only what they're doing, but how, why they're doing it. And when the students know about how, how their brain works, then they, end up, then they appreciate the strategy, and it's much more meaningful. Instead of, oh, well, something we've got to do, they say, aha. And they realize that the teacher is trying to do something to make them succeed. So absolutely, the more we can teach them, the better. And they love it, usually.